Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory has always been one of my most favourite childhood films. It still holds a special place in my heart and I'll always happily re-watch it, especially over the remake, which the less spoken about that the better. We have the great glass elevator to speed things up. There has always been this thing that makes the original such a timeless classic, but upon many, many rewatches of this film over the years, I started to pick up on some sinister undertones, and I started looking at the man himself as more of a person rather than the magical wizard of chocolate as every other character talks him up to be. If you can remove any concept of this movie being actually magical, look at Willy Wonka as just a human being that runs a successful candy factory. Seeing the events of the film play out and how he deals with everything opens up a whole world of interpretation. One day a bunch of these theories started running through my head, and now the way I see the events of this movie is only how I see it. But aside from this just being my theory, there are too many examples in this movie that actually prove my case, and I thought it was time to put it all into a video. So this video will touch on a lot of unsettling themes, but hopefully by the end of this video you will see what I'm going for here. And rather than just saying what Willy Wonka's dark plan is up front, I think it's best that we just unwrap it piece by piece. So here we go. It's no surprise that Willy Wonka's reactions to the kids falling into danger is a bit questionable. I wonder how long he's going to take him to push through. The suspense is terrible. He, he's going to go this time. I hope it'll last. That's all. Don't you know what this is? My gum, it's gum. Wrong. Stop. Don't. Why doesn't she listen to Mr. Wonka? Look at me. I'm going to be the first person in the world to be sent by television. Stop. Don't. Come back. Where's she going? Where all the other bad eggs go? Down the garbage chute. Oh, the garbage chute. <laughs> where, where does it lead to? To the furnace. <laughs> to furnace! <laughs> I've always jokingly said that Willy Wonka was a complete sociopath, and I think most people can see it too. Everyone thinks of him as being this magical John Hammond type character who has wonder in his eyes for what he does. But from Willy Wonka's introduction all throughout the film, how he responds to the misbehavior of the children is very telling of how cynical he is as a person. In the film, Grandpa Joe says that Wonka shut down his factory for three years and no one knew why. Where I'm going with this is that Willy Wonka saw how greedy the emerging world was becoming and had a complete mental breakdown. Wonka shut down his factory after realizing he was playing a role in making children selfish and ungrateful for what they have. The guy singing in the candy bar would be like many others, putting Wonka on a pedestal for his variety of delicious candies, but what he was actually doing was programming children to want more buy more and demand more. He saw that his wealth was actually causing more harm than good. And so, what do you think he was doing in that three years of silence? He was watching the world through television and newspapers, spending three years coming up with his sinister plan that I'll get back to later on in this video. But what Wonka learnt is how easily the masses can be manipulated, very much like the Joker from The Dark Knight. When the chips are down, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. A realization of humanity that has just been proven in these modern times. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the sign of our times. The symbol of the havoc, the mad craze that's sweeping the world today. What are people going to do when they are hit with an extraordinary bit of news? The masses running to the shops in a frenzy, panic buying to come out on top over everyone else, a psycho sheep mentality that results in resources running out, and there isn't enough for people who are less fortunate, seeing law enforcers securing such mundane everyday items, and all this fear mongering propaganda just amplified by the news. Four down and one to go. And somewhere out there, another lucky person is moving closer and closer to finding the last of the most sought after prizes in history. Four people dying across the country. Our total losses now at 12. Australia's cases are growing by the hour. 2,799 people have been diagnosed with the disease. If Charlie found the last golden ticket in this day and age, the crowd would have trampled him for it. No one would have congratulated him for it. So Wonka knew only greedy kids would hunt down the tickets. But it would be the parents forking out the cash, doing anything to make their ungrateful child happy. But one child he did not plan on finding a golden ticket was the poor kid with the heart of gold, Charlie Bucket. Although this movie came out in 1971, this movie has a Great Depression era vibe about it. The filmmakers shot this movie in Munich, so it would feel like it was set in any time. It's certainly the way Charlie's life is visually portrayed. And back in those days, candy and chocolate were an amazing luxury, especially compared to cabbage water. Is this your supper, Grandpa? Well, it's yours too, Charlie. I'm fed up with cabbage water. How about this? Charlie, where'd you get that? It's my first payday. Good for you, Charlie. 
We'll have a real banquet. And after the Great Depression, when most of the world was black and white, what could be more magical than candy? Everyone in Charlie's family all suffer from depression due to being poor. His father died, his mother has to work non-stop, and his grandparents are bedridden. And Charlie, as young as he is, takes up a paper route to make more money for the family, keeping his loved ones as the main focus over spending his pay on chocolate like the other kids in town. Which adds a contrast to all of the adults in the film. None of them idolize chocolate like the kids do, because they're all grown-ups. Here. Everybody have a bite. No, no, no. You no, 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 no. All the adults aren't interested in the chocolate, but they pretend to be to see a smile on Charlie's face. Hence the mother's song, Cheer Up Charlie. They all understand the misery of being poor, but it kills them to see Charlie having to deal with depression in such an adult way. Well, that's that. No more golden tickets. A lot of rubbish, the whole thing. Not to Charlie, it wasn't. A little boy's got to have something in this world to hope for. What's he got to hope for now? The song I've Got a Golden Ticket should really have been sung by Charlie, but instead is sung by Grandpa Joe. And when you think about it, the song would only be sung by grateful poor people. This is a song you sing when you are battling depression, have nothing, and you get one glimmer of hope. None of the other winners would celebrate like this. Augustus, how does it make you feel to be the first golden ticket finder? Hungry! Any other feelings? Feel sorry for Wonka. It's gonna cost him a fortune in fudge. Ticket number three, and it's all mine. But when I heard about these ticket things of Wonka's, I laid off the gum and switched to candy bars instead. Right. Mike, the country wants to hear from you. The world is waiting. Can't you shut up? I'm busy. But more on Charlie's involvement in Wonka's plan later. Wonka came up with a test before his plan came to fruition, the everlasting gobstopper. This was a test to see if kids who demanded candy and chocolate non-stop, if they were given one piece of candy that would last forever, would they be satisfied with just that, or would they sell that for profit, but still demand more? Slugworth was also a plant to report back to Wonka and inform him how greedy these kids were. Although this was revealed at the end. Meet Mr. Wilkinson. Pleasure. Slugworth! No, no, that's not Slugworth, he works for me! He wasn't just a red herring, he also informed Wonka on all of these kids' personality traits, so he knew exactly what to anticipate for the big day. This is telling when Wonka greets them at the gate one by one. My dear Baruka, what a pleasure, and how pretty you look in that lovely mink coat. I've got three others at home. Augustus, my dear boy, how good to see you, and in such fine shape. Darling child, welcome to Wonka's. What kind of gum you got here? Charming. I'm Mike TV. Well, wow, you're dead. Wonderful to meet you, Mike. But Charlie is the only kid who he doesn't mimic or encourage their personality. Well, well, Charlie Bucket, I read all about you in the papers. I'm so happy for you. I think how much Willy Wonka being a sociopath is reflected in the Oompa Loompa songs. Assuming they're an actual race from another country called Loompa Land, why would they write these songs if they know nothing about the Western world? Also, they sang perfect English. Maybe there is no such thing as Oompa Loompas. Maybe the factory had real staff workers that Wonka fired days before the events of the film and hired a bunch of local little people and painted them up. My theory is that Wonka wrote the Oompa Loompa songs and he wrote them for each specific a kid. After everything that fake Slugworth told him about each child, he planned the rooms and songs accordingly. Before we get into Wonka's big dark plan in a bit, there's another element to the scenario that fits into his behaviour for the entire film. So, I'm just gonna say it, Willy Wonka was on drugs this entire movie. I realised this looking at the boat ride scene. Now if this is in the book, it would say scary but thrilling boat ride that ends fine. Now what you would expect was in Tim Burton's movie, like an actual wacky boat ride going around tunnels and water slides and ugh. But what you wouldn't imagine is seeing footage of chickens getting their fucking heads cut off, lizards eating bugs, gross worms on people's faces, and Willy Wonka singing this weird song. There's no knowing where we're rowing. rowing. <laughs> is the grizzly reaper mowing? Yes! Not to mention all the trippy flashing colours. Once it's in your mind that he's on drugs, you can see it in every scene. Wonka took a little something something before they entered the factory. And what proceeds is a bunch of set pieces he designed to mess with everyone. First of all, the room they walk into before the big room where they can eat everything. The trick where it's the same door but different exit. It's probably just an elevator. Oh, you can't get out backwards. Gotta go forwards to go back. 
the shrinking room that isn't shrunk on the reveal, the roof and floor were probably on hydraulics that would go up and down when the big door opens, and when he begins singing the pure imagination song, come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination, in a world of my creation. And while singing the song, he just fucks with them, stopping them from walking down the steps, like he's trolling them for their reactions. He knows how greedy and impatient they are. So all of this was designed. Let me in, I'm starving. Now don't get overexcited. Don't lose your head, Augustus. We wouldn't want anyone to lose that, yet. Why let them go straight into having fun, eating all the candy in the next room? When you're high off your tits, then just drag it out and watch all these ungrateful people freak out. What I found is there's two ticks with Wonka. He's very chilled the entire time watching his dark plan play out. But the only times Wonka shows emotion is when they fuck with his chocolate river. So my theory is this room was an actual room for the chocolate to be churned. This is actually real, and he's so proud of it. It's mixing my chocolate. It's actually churning my chocolate. You know, no other factory in the world mixes its chocolate by waterfall but no one gives a shit. But this entire room in the factory was purely set up just for this one day. All the edible things were just put in for today. Because come on, it would all melt in the heat, ants would get in and be all over everything. Like the brick wall goes into the chocolate river. And there's a spider web on the tube for crying out loud. It's all unsanitary. And so when Augustus falls in, he actually freaks out. My chocolate! My chocolate! My beautiful chocolate! But then he remembers that this is all part of his plan. Don't just stand there, do something! Help. Police. Murder. Where is he? Watch the pipe. The other tick is his sarcastic quips whenever no one is impressed by his inventions or names for them. This little piece of gum is a three-course dinner. Bull. No, roast beef, but I haven't got it quite right yet. Hasa Is that Japanese? No, that's Wonka Wash spelled backwards. We'll take the Wonka Vader. It's perfect. It's unbelievable. It's a miracle. It's a TV dinner. It's Wonka vision. The Wonka boat ride was purely set up for when he was peaking on acid. Look at the way he's staring at everyone. He's like, man, I'm just gonna flash the most fucked footage on the projectors while the boat is stationary, and I'm just gonna watch them all lose their minds. Here, try one of these. What are they? Rainbow drops. Suck them and you can spit in seven different colors. Yeah, I wonder what's in that stuff, Wonka. Do you spit seven different colors, or is what's hidden inside it make you see seven colors? The the cream testing room was a whole joke room, set up so he could make dumb dad jokes. Time is a precious thing, never wasted. What's that for? Gives it a little kick. What's the matter? Too hot, Mr. Wonka? Too cold. Far too cold. In fact, the cream room looks like it's been ransacked and filled with all of these stupid dumb props. And later on, if you look at the Wonka washmobile, it's like a big tank with wheels added to it. I think the cream room was ripped apart and built into this stupid bike car that vomits cream and foam on everyone. Lickable wallpaper for nursery walls. Need I say more? The strawberries taste like strawberries. The snozberries taste like snozberries. The snozberries taste like snozberries. <laughs> Speaking of spiking everyone, one could say a lot of the wacky visuals could actually just be the point of view of Wonka and the other characters tripping. Maybe Violet had an allergic reaction to the gum and swelled up. But everyone was spiked, so she just looked like a blueberry. Maybe the fizzy lifting drink had a little something in it. Charlie and Grandpa Joe weren't actually floating up. They just felt that way because of the bubbles moving upwards. We're really high now. And there wasn't a ceiling fan, it was just a desk fan that they were too close to. Veruca was dumb enough to climb up on machinery, thinking she was safe. And Wonka even predicted this at the start of the film. You're always making things difficult! Nicely handled, Veruca. She's a girl who knows where she's going. Wonka Vision is... Eh, I don't know how to explain this one. Probably some shrinking technology Wonka stole from the Russians. You're born into Ant-Man, you can buy into this. All I know is that Mike's not surviving this one. You can't stretch him back to normal size. Veruca's dad probably isn't spiked because he seems to be the only rational one the whole time. There's no earthly way of knowing. <laughs> He's singing. What is this, Wonka? Some kind of fun house? Why, having fun? But a scotch, but a gin. Got something going on inside of it. Now's the time to get into Willy Wonka's dark plan. What he was crafting for three years in isolation. 
Seeing the world for what it is, processing it for three years, sent out five golden tickets to which only greedy children would find, set up all these fake magical rooms in the factory, and let all the kids meet their fates by their own hands, and when all is said and done, get into the supposed flying elevator while high on drugs, and then drop to the ground, and the whole world will be watching. But this roof is made of glass, it'll shatter in a thousand pieces, but we will be cut to ribbons. Probably. Now how I got to this theory is by what you don't see after the end credits. You don't see any of the kids make it out alive, you don't see the Wonka Vader return safely back into the factory, and you don't see the following events of Charlie and his family moving into the factory. Which is all shown in the remake, the nice and fluffy safe remake. For the sociopath, depression and drug points I made earlier. This all fits into the suicide plan. Before Wonka goes out forever, he's gonna prove where the whole world is going. How the next generation will be spoilt, greedy and ungrateful, and how life morals will decrease as the world goes on. And you're probably thinking, why was Charlie in the Wonka Vader when it was meant to be Wonka's suicide? Well that's where this whole event has two sides. After the magical day at the chocolate factory, what has Charlie got to hope for? After Wonka's plan, what was he left with? A factory that's about to burn to the ground in legal battles despite the dodgy contract that Wonka made all the kids sign. He would just be back to square one. Yeah, let him sleep. Let him have one last dream. All Charlie dreamt about throughout this whole movie was to win a golden ticket. That was his last dream, but Wonka gave him an even better one. How did you like the chocolate factory, Charlie? I think it's the most wonderful place in the whole world. I'm very pleased to hear you say that, because I'm giving it to you. Wonka knew there was no better life for Charlie to return to, but in his mind, and where it has gone after three years in isolation, the phrase he says about Charlie giving him back the everlasting gobstopper is what he thinks he's doing for Charlie. So shines a good deed in a weary world. All the things in his office being in half, at first glance, this could be a representation that he's an incomplete man. Maybe there's a part of his psyche that's missing. I would say that this is a visual representation that he is now coming down from all the drugs he's taken. This would explain his out of character mood swing. But you can see he's smoking something as they enter the room. Something's about to kick in. Something that might make you a bit happy. And just as this happens, Charlie completes the final part of his plan. Returns the everlasting gobstopper, as Wonka predicted. You did it! You did it! I knew you would! I just knew you would! Everything came to plan. Wonka proved that 4 out of 5 kids are rotten, and that's the future. But in a twisted way, he's going to save the fifth child. And Grandpa Joe actually predicts the ending. How can you do a thing like this? Build up a little boy's hopes and then smash all his dreams to pieces! They get into the glass elevator, they burst into the sky. As they are flying above the town, Wonka promises Charlie the factory. All his family can move in, he'll own the most financially successful chocolate business in the world. He gets to see Charlie's eyes light up like the brightest Christmas. How could a boy possibly ever know happiness beyond this point? This happiness that Wonka gave a little boy that only knew poverty, loneliness, and social neglect. A little boy's gotta have something in this world to hope for. What's he got to hope for now? Yeah, let him sleep. Let him have one last dream. One last dream that came true. But Charlie, don't forget what happened to the man who suddenly got everything he always wanted. What happened? He lived happily ever after. And then the flying mechanism in the elevator stops working, and then they drop out of the sky, right into... Yeah. This movie isn't about any of that. It's about magic and wonder. It has strong morals for children, but it's a kid's movie. Come on. Ah. Sort of. So this video was for all intents and purposes meant to be an April Fool's video like my last one. To take one of my dumb wacky joke theories and play them completely straight. But the truth is while writing this video, the more and more it became real to me. A real reflection of the world right now. And something I want to state about this movie. This isn't the only dark theory I have about this movie. I have so many more. But this was just the biggest and most depressing theory. If you would like to hear more then drop a comment letting me know and I'll compile all of them into another video. But that's my point. This movie has so many layers and undertones, overtones. It's like a Stanley Kubrick movie. But then you look at the remake. The remake is so fucking lifeless, basic, and by the books. And you can't pull any dark jokes or theories from it. Johnny Depp based Willy Wonka off of Michael Jackson. 
Ah. Oh. oh, the factory has no ceiling, making it look like a rape dungeon. This movie teaches kids not to be greedy, and the movie teaches that lesson in such a complex, amazing way. I love this movie, despite how much I probably ruined it for all of you. Despite this dark theory, I can still watch it and feel the magic. Leave Grandpa Joe alone. He was old and he couldn't work anymore. The only reason he sprung out of bed was because of the magic of chocolate in the fucking Great Depression. Nowadays, you're depressed because you're stuck in bed because you ate too much chocolate. 